Dear students, welcome to our first lecture in the course of Water Resource Engineering in which we are going to deal a lot with water and its engineering aspects. This course is divided into two parts. While the first part will deal with various aspects of hydrology, hydrological cycle and on an average water distribution relevant to engineering, the second part of this course would deal with design of hydraulic structures, for example, canals or pipe flow that is relevant to engineering design. To begin with, what we are going to learn in this part one, we are going to talk about the hydrology which deals with all the phases of water that is present in earth and its atmosphere. The important question arises why we have to study a hydrological cycle that we have learned in class 5th, class 6 as civil engineers because we are going behind the quantification of intuition. We have learned that water is in cyclone. If we have water in plenty, that becomes a drought. If we uh, that becomes a flood. If we have water in scanty, we have a drought. And both of these conditions, they require some engineering and policy interventions for overall well-being of the persons or overall well-being of the society. Also, from purely from engineering perspective, we have in the hydraulic or water retaining structures. For example, the big dams or the big reservoirs that we have to build as civil engineers, they have to account for the forces coming from the water. Also, these forces are directly related to what is the quantity of water that is flowing or being retained by dams or reservoirs. Second is, as civil engineers, we also design water supply and treatment facilities. In your previous course, that is on sustainability and environment, you got some flavor around the water quality issues that why we have to treat water, why we have to treat wastewater and hence determining how much water is available in a given community is important so that we can plan the water distribution networks accordingly, design the appropriate water purification measures and make sure that the wastewater if that particular place is indeed drought prone is not going waste. Third thing that we do as civil engineers, we design the hydropower facilities. So if you look at big dams and reservoirs, in addition to solving the purpose of irrigation, these dams and reservoirs also generate the hydropower. And what would be the estimate of hydropower capacities associated with each dam or, or water reservoir, we need to understand this hydrological cycle so that we can also determine what is the firm power or minimum assured power that a particular project is going to deliver. Fourth that we already talked about, we have to plan against floods. We have to make our cities flood safe and hence we need to understand what would be the inflow of water that would be coming, how it would be draining and what are the paths that it is going to eventually take before it joins a big river which ultimately goes and joins the ocean. And finally, if we have to also understand how much sediments will flow because when we talk about hydropower projects, these sediments or the loads that flowing water brings with it can damage the machinery that, that is being housed in a power generation plant. To minimize all those losses, we need to have a good estimate that what would be inflow of the debris or rocks or other materials would be coming when high flowing water is stopped at the dams or reservoir site. Now, this motivation will become more and more clear when we go into specific examples and also from the scientific perspective, understanding hydrological cycle is important because Whenever we are talking about global change or climate change, hydrological cycle is one of, this, one of the most influenced aspect that has resulted in uneven distribution of the most critical resource, which is water. Now, with this background, what we are going to study here, so this is a cartoonish representation of a hydrological cycle that you must have learned in your earlier classes of geography, where we deal with the various aspects that how water is, it, water remains in the circulation 
in our earth and atmosphere so we would be essentially talking about various processes for example how to quantify this surface runoff what is the precipitation how precipitation is formed how to estimate the quantity of precipitation what is the distribution of precipitation in the context of india now once this precipitation reaches the land what happens to individual drop of precipitation that is received so some of them will join the rivers and would run as surface runoff some of them would be retained into the potholes or the big ditches that we have and that water is going to stay there unless it evaporates or it gets enough of the force so that it again also becomes the part of the surface runoff some of this water it would be retained by the plants or the canopy or the leaves of these plants some of this water would be able to infiltrate and become the ground water flow and ultimately all this water will take the path of least resistance that would mean that it will flow from higher point to lower point and ultimately we would identify some of the ideal sites where to build our dams and reservoirs where we will store this water to meet sub to to utilize this water for various purposes that we just discussed and finally some of this water will be let out of these reservoirs or if it is untamed watershed or basin this water will directly flow into the ocean without being stopped by reservoir or check dam and we know that oceans are these are big water bodies which house around 96.5% of the water on surface of the earth and hence their role is going to be the most critical when it comes to maintain the hydrological water balance now with this background let us look into some specific aspects that why we need to understand hydrology in the context of anthropogenic activities now we just learned that we would be dealing with various components within the earth that means water will enter into our our water will will reach the land and after that it may be evaporated or it may go inside the ground and the the activities that shape the present surface of the earth would have huge control that what is going to be the fate of that drop of water we just spoke about now when we talk about anthropogenic changes we say that humans have accelerated the rate of burning of fossil fuels so fossil fuel burning has gone up the urbanization or land use has changed drastically we used where we used to have thick coverages of forests which facilitate in the groundwater recharge now we have concrete jungles what result in the faster outflow as a result of which whenever you receive precipitation it would not have time to be absorbed by ground and ultimately will become runoff and you might have heard of this phenomena what we call as urban flooding that means whatever we receive as precipitation around 80 to 90% of it becomes part of the runoff and ultimately runs away resulting in flash floods in certain urban areas whenever we receive heavy precipitation now how it is related to the context of hydrology because we are going to talk about certain theories which says that on an average warmer atmosphere would be able to hold more moisture content in form of vapors and there is a famous relationship what we call as clausius clapeyron relationship that we will learn in detail when we go to precipitation which serves as our first intuition that why climate change messes up hydrological cycle resulting in intense shorter duration precipitation spills that may result in the instant onset of flooding and there is an ongoing evidence that certain events are increasing resulting in increased magnitudes duration and frequency of floods so how to quantify that we will look into certain statistical aspects to deal with the real world precipitation data finally from engineering perspective we just learned that we would be designing a dam and water would be flowing as outflow from various areas falling within our catchment and this water would be stored in this water hydraulic retaining structure but so dams are basically hydraulic structures as they are designed to deal with water 
now the strength of this dam critically depends how much sediment it water is bringing with it and what is the level of water that this dam has to retain in your fluid mechanics class you might have heard of these pressure diagrams what we called as hydrostatic pressure distribution so hydrostatic pressure distribution would have important uh, implications for design of these water retaining structures so now let us say that you have designed this dam for some design discharge which is q meter cube per second but because of these persistent anthropogenic changes that we are talking about as well as combined with climate variability that means climate is not going to be the same year after year there are some natural variations associated that's why you see that there are hotter summers one year and comparatively more comfortable summers next year so that could actually result in some massive non negligible differences in the discharges against what we have designed so rather than catering to q meter cube you may have to deal with q plus delta q meter cube per second where delta q is significantly different from zero and then in that case you need to determine the precise or exact values of these delta q with given uncertainty bounds that can help you design these infrastructure systems better also i have introduced a word called as uncertainty which will become very clear that why we have to be very much mindful of uncertainty whenever we are dealing with the hydrological system now that it is clear that we have to deal with the global water first of all we should know that how much water is present where and what is the concept of residence time in the context of hydrology as i just mentioned that out of 100 96.5% of our water it is present in the oceans and you know that ocean water is of limited or less use either for engineering applications or for drinking water given its high salinity so we would be essentially looking at the terrestrial water and terrestrial water deals with all the water that is present on the land now out of this terrestrial water which is just 2.5% of the global water storage that we have 1.7% is present in the permanent ice caps or what we call as polar ice so this water is again of no use because it's always going to be there in the frozen form second thing is 1.7% water oh, so so this would be 2. Point, uh, this would be sorry 3.5 1.7% water is present in the form of ground water and out of this 1.7% of ground water large fraction of it is unretrievable as it has percolated deep down in lower strata so at the end we are dealing with 0.1% sources which constitute the surface and atmospheric water and when we talk about surface water this would be the water that is available in lakes that is available in 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 uh, rivers and atmospheric waters water that is always present in our atmosphere that constitute cloud and so on despite the fact that this is just 0.1% of water that we are dealing with this hydrological systems they are dynamical systems and what this word dynamical means dynamical means that there is always a constant non zero flux associated with various components for example although oceans they have 96.5% of the water on an average there is always lo lot of evaporation that is happening some precipitation is happening this evaporation will result in cloud formation these clouds will go somewhere else and they may be form bigger more denser cloud resulting in precipitation and when this precipitation happens the transport has taken essentially from ocean to land similarly reverse phenomena can also occur because we have already talked about there are rivers there are lakes they can also do this evaporation formation of clouds these clouds can again go over oceans and spill their water there and hence this becomes a very complex system which is always in motion and we are interested to understand as in hydrological processes is that what is the quantitative value of these fluxes 
and this is essentially an engineering and non trivial problem that we are going to seek an answer to secondly once we receive a water it will flow through channels it will flow through rivers we want to determine that if x mm per day of precipitation takes place how much water would be there in the river which because this river may be passing through multiple cities and if this river overflows water would enter into the cities resulting in the devastation in form of flooding and hence this essentially becomes a water management challenge but to facilitate that management we need to understand the quantitative aspects of the subject now since this water is always in motion that would mean that we can always calculate some residence time associated and we define this residence time as what is the storage that is associated with particular entity divided by what is the flow rate so for example if we talk about the atmosphere the amount of precipitation that happens over the land is of the magnitude of 1 lakh 19000 kilometer cube per year see if you convert it into meter cube this is going to be a big quantity so this much is the volume of water we receive over land in form of precipitation similarly oceans receive around 3 times of this precipitation which comes out to be 458000 kilometer cube per year now if you look at this is the water that is flowing out of the atmosphere which is q on an average atmosphere has a storage of 1 to 900 km cube of water which is present either in form of vapors or in form of clouds or in form of small ice sleets that form in cloud and so on so now we know that this is the s and this is the q associated with the atmosphere and when we talk about residence time of a water drop in an atmosphere it can be calculated simply by by dividing s by q and it comes on an average to be 8.2 days now what is the physical significance of this number of 8.2 days so it tells that on an average one drop of water has a mean lifetime of 8 days until it's it stays in the atmosphere and then it will reach the ground again it becomes part of the terrestrial hydrological cycle and again it would be evaporated back and so on and also this is one first one of the many reasons that why state of weather is not predictable beyond a certain time so after 6 to 7 to 8 days you would not be able to tell what is the confidence or what with with some assurance that this area is going to receive precipitation or not because that exceeds the mean residence time and that makes this prediction of weather problem little bit tricky when we talk about at larger time scale now when we talk about the quantification of aspects of hydrological cycle we have to realize that we are talking about a dynamical system because we just saw that this system is in motion and on an average after 8 days that same drop of water would be recycled this system is complex we have already talked about oceans rivers lands mountains and what not whatever you think forms the part of our earth system that is going to be the part of our hydrological process third thing is that this particular system would have lot of uncertainties associated because yes we intuitively know that whenever there would be an evaporation followed by cooling there would be a precipitation but how much is the magnitude of that precipitation covering this entire area of earth specifically oceans collections of data to estimate the the accurate values of various fluxes associated with this hydrological phenomena is going to be tough and hence there is an uncertainty associated now this dynamical complex uncertain system quantification of various aspects is going to be a challenge so what we will do we will use the systems concept in hydrology
and we will divide our entire hydrological course into smaller subsystems which i am going to show here and we will spend some time on individual elements and try to get some intuition behind that how these systems work in isolation and how we would fit it together so we will essentially divide our entire hydrological processes into three subsystems one will deal with the subsurface water second will deal with the surface water that means rivers flow uh, the interception that has happened in the potholes or big ditches or canyons and finally the atmospheric water that means the formation of clouds and precipitation and loss of water back into atmosphere through the processes of evaporation and so on and what we will do first of all we will deal with these systems independently or in isolation try to develop some mathematical understanding followed by we will try to put them together that how these processes are coupled with each other using the abstract hydrological models so these abstract hydrological models will unify the sub systems that we have broken down into various components now that we are talking about fluids in motion we will be talking about conservation laws and these conservation laws would be conservation of mass conservation of energy and wherever applicable conservation of momentum and combining mass plus energy plus momentum we would be dealing with the various aspects of these sub systems that i have discussed for example when we will go to evaporation we will talk about certain aspects of conservation of mass and conservation of energies combined together that will tell us how much water is going to be evaporated from a given lake or a given river if sun is falling on that area on a given day of an year which is prime source of energy now with this let us define our first hydrological